So you've done extensive research in how elite athletes are made. What are some of the variables that athletes cannot control, which seem to impact their athletic success? Well, there's quite a lot of serendipity or luck involved in becoming an elite athlete. I mean, firstly, of course, the role of parents is very important. We don't choose our parents. And clearly their interest in sport, in getting you uh, engaged in the sport, potentially taking you to practice and in facilitating that early engagement in the sport is quite paramount. Uh, there is a fair amount of empirical evidence actually that highlights that um, your chances of becoming an elite athlete are much greater if you're a, uh, a younger sibling. So having older siblings, again, uh, encourage you to enter into the sport, uh, provide a, an active role model, someone that you can play with, practice with and learn from. Uh, other sort of Aspects of serendipity around becoming an elite athlete might focus on, for instance, the place of birth. I mean, clearly, for example, if you're born somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, your chances of being an elite skier are much higher than if you're born in the Midwest. In fact, 75% of Olympic skiers are born within an hour of the slopes. Let's talk about how elite athletes are different from us mere mortals. You know, so you report that elite athletes are better and faster at processing visual stimuli. Can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you will often hear the, uh, the commentator on the football game uh, go, the player's got a great eye, super vision. And it obviously implies that, uh, you know, the athlete has superhuman vision, a little bit like Superman, for instance. But that actually isn't the case. I mean, what happens is through prolonged engagement in the sport, these um, athletes develop knowledge structures in memory that allow them to perceive the world around them very differently to us. Uh, so they become better at anticipating. So, for instance, in the case of a baseball batter, uh, he or she gets better at... Um, picking up information from the body shape, the postural orientation of the pitcher, um, and they're able to actually use this information to predict where the ball will end up in space, even before the pitchers release the ball. Uh, on top of that, the batter is able to pick up information from you know, the pitch orientations, the loading on the bases, the score in the game, a previous knowledge of that pitcher, the pitcher's tendencies, what type of deliveries does he or she like to, to, to throw at different stages in the game. So because of this advanced knowledge, it's rarely that sport is a reactive event. It's actually one where these elite performers anticipate very early. So they can see the future uh, before it emerges. And this, of course, makes it look as if they've got all the time in the world you know, it gives them time to move into position to make the right decision or to execute the shot in the most effective manner. Can, can you talk about kind of the, the weekender athlete? You know, the, I play, you know, I might play in a men's basketball league or, or a softball league. Um, what advice um, from a kind of training perspective or how to approach getting better as a non-professional kind of but, but weekend athlete? Sure. Um, well, passion and interest is, is important first and foremost, but um, one thing that actually differentiates between experts and less expert performers actually is the fact that uh, the less expert performers spend a lot of time practicing the things they're already good at, whereas experts actually spend more of their time practicing the things that they're not so good at. So they engage in what in the literature might term deliberate practice, which is specific, purposeful practice to improve some aspect of performance. So it's looking at your practice in a different way. And of course, one of the challenges of doing work that um, isn't more similar to deliberate practice is you do, you will fail. more. So uh, it's learning to cope with the fact that failure is an opportunity to learn and to develop. And if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and not stretching the system, then you're not going to adapt and develop new skills. I really love that you said that because as you were talking about it and thinking back just my little myopic life, 
you know, when I played sports, I loved doing the stuff that I was good at because it was positively reinforced me. If I was doing a layup or taking a slap shot or a wrist shot, I would pick the tool of choice because I knew I was better at it and I would have more success. Actually, it fits into coaching to some degree as well because, you know, uh, we differentiate in the literature between performance and learning. When, if you're a coach taking a practice session, then what you see in that practice session is actually their performance and not their learning. Give them lots of instruction, do a repetitive block practice of a single skill and provide lots of feedback that performance is good in the session. And ironically, the research evidence suggests that almost the reverse conditions are better for promoting long-term retention and transfer. So that maybe as a coach, I should think, well, what is the least amount of instruction that I need to give the athlete so that he or she can begin to practice the skill? To what extent are my practice conditions dynamic, variable, and challenging so that they reflect the demands of competition, not just technically and tactically, but also physically, physiologically, psychologically? And what is the least amount of feedback that I need to give the athlete? Uh, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we may as a society be guilty of overcoaching and being too prescriptive and not allowing kids the opportunity to engage in discovery learning.